Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning into the Destro Show today. We have a very special guest for you. Legendary wrestling promoter Tony Candelo is here on the show. Hi, Tony. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, please? Uh, I'm Tony Candelo, wrestling promoter for many years. And I'm glad to talk to you guys way up north. I've never been up there, but uh, I've been in the north, believe me. That's exactly why we wanted to talk to you, Tony. Tell me a bit about where you where you operate out of, and and tell me uh, we will definitely get to the northern uh, the northern tours for sure. But tell us a bit about where you operate out of. I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I've been here all my life. Actually, I come. Uh, I was born in Italy. I came in. I was 11 years old, and uh, took up wrestling as an amateur when I was 14 years old, and uh, continuation from there. And uh, age 17. I wrestled pro for the AWA in Minneapolis, or Vern Gagne, all those guys, the Baron and so forth. And uh, 1972, I became a promoter. Many different people from my, uh, uh, actually, in 1972, I opened up a school, and I was a promoter licensed by the government. But anyway, from there on, I continue up to date. And so what was it that got you into pro wrestling? What got you started? What was the appeal for you? Why did I start pro wrestling? Yes. I tell you what, I was an amateur for many years. Like I said, uh, at least four or five years. Actually, one day, the local wrestlers I used to go to the AWA for TV taping, they asked me to go for a ride to Minneapolis. And I did. I went in there, and uh, of course, Wally Carbo and Bert Gagne, they kid, you want to make $75? I mean, that goes back in the late 60s. I said, oh, no, well, what for? Just to wrestle. I said, I think I need to wrestle. I came here to watch you guys. And of course, I was a wrestler at that point in time. But the local guy says, come on, come down, don't be chicken. I said, what did you call me? He called me chicken right now. So I said, I'll tell you what. I got no boots, I got no trunks, I have nothing. I didn't bring anything, you can't get to wrestle. So anyway, they bought me a pair of trunks and a uh, pair of boots, and they stopped in that ring in Minneapolis there, uh, I think it was Channel 11 or wherever that was, and uh, they put him against a guy named Lars Anderson, one of the biggest uh, villains uh, that I used to watch. I said, what the hell is going on here? I didn't know anything about pro wrestling. So my mind walked up to the ring, and saying to myself, how the hell am I going to beat this guy? <laughs> Six foot three, 275 pounds, or wherever he was. Anyway, he let me work. He just said, touch. But anyway, what happened, I just, the only way to beat him, I got to go for his legs. And I did, and he went down. I said to myself, I'm not strong to put this guy down just like that. Then, of course, got in a headlock, and he put me in. He said, kiddo. This is not a price fight, just do it. Not what I tell you to do, and everything will be fine. Now, what I'm thinking is, I've been in the United States the first time I've been to the States, I better cause any problem because they might throw me out out of the United States. So I followed him. He gave me about seven, eight minutes, and one, two, three, and they clued me in what's going on. And because of that, the same uh, episode the show didn't want to take. And uh, of course, at that time, a guy named Jim Trumanoff was the wrestling promoter for the, for the amateurs and the professional. He see me wrestling on TV and said, kid, you got paid, you lose your amateur statics. I said, what are you talking about? Well, I said, well, what happened? I said, if you want an amateur static is back, you got to wait five years. So if you're 17 years old, you're never going to wait for five years for nobody. So Vern Gagne and Wally Carson, you know, he says, you gain a little better weight. I tell him I weigh 165 pounds. He says, gain a little better weight and we can use you. It took me a year and a half, of course. Uh, from 165, I reached 209, you know, like a horse and weightlifting like crazy. I worked for them for 12 years in AWA. And uh, they used to book me under Tony Savoldi from Chicago. Okay, So before I quit them, I did 3,613 different events in, uh, in records. I don't keep the records, but somebody locally here in Winnipeg, he's, uh, he's a writer, and he, that's what he tells me. And then in 1972, I opened up a school. I was going to teach my own crew, which I did. I had about 45 students, and uh, some of them, they became big superstars. One of them, a young kid 
17 years old. He answered my ad from the Winnipeg Free Press. He wants to be a wrestler. He gave me $10 down payment. I never seen another dime after that. And uh, 1973, I had uh, he's going to be his first match. I, I didn't have a stage name for him yet. So, but anyway, what happened? He tells me, Tony, I'll be I'll be at the gym about quarter to ten in the evening. I said, just a minute. Leave the women's alone and come and work out. Oh, no. so I'm taking music lessons. I said, okay. Comes back to the club about ten o'clock, and I says to him, "Did you take your music lessons?" He don't believe me, eh? Okay, he goes inside his car, he brings in his bagpipes. As a promoter at that time, I'm going, and I did have a stage name for him, and started thinking for a name for him. I said, can you play those things? And he did. Very, he can play the bagpipes really well. His name, of course, is Roderick Toombs. I gave him a name, Roddy Piper. That's what he was, that's what he was created. So here's what I want you to do, walk up to the ring and... Uh, Play this backpipe to what kind of match you're going to get. So, of course, at that time of point, he wrestled me for the first time, 1973, June 5th, at 150 River Avenue. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore in Winnipeg. And uh, he got a lot of big response. And, uh, of course, at that time, he was about, I don't know, 18, 19 years old already. He was a little bit experienced through the ring. And so, I mean, I kept the daylight to that kid. But, yeah, he was with me about three years. And uh, after that, he says, Tony, can you do me a favor? I said, what can I do? He says, I'm engaged to be married. I don't know what, what I should do. Hit, hit the road or get married? So I said, get off. I cannot answer that question. So he left Winnipeg. He left his girlfriend behind. And uh, he went to pull the horn on. And from there on, uh, back in 74, 75, something like that, the rest of history became... Uh, uh, up to 1981, I believe, it became a hot rod, Roddy Piper with the Vince McMahon. And of course, at that time and point, he had the only one dispute with me and Mr. Roddy Piper. Uh, he was smoking pot, okay, I've got a stick in the mud, but I said, not smoke, there's stuff in my car. And at that point in time, then, of course, in the 70s or 80s or whatever, I was just to you, and of course, they're going to nail you for having drugs. And uh, one day he said, well, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? I said, I'm just a promoter, Roddy, because you were smoking in the car, right? We keep uh, pushing the point, so we stopped the car on a highway in the middle, middle of nowhere. I'm doing, uh, I was doing about 10 different events that time, and we had an out. Very good box of the son of a gun. Oh. In a couple places, but I, I got the best out of him. And of course... The road is the road, and uh, we became friends again. And uh, uh, I said to him, one of these days, you're going to go from that to something else, which he did, coke, that is, which I did his business, not mine, but I warned him about it. And, uh, of course, you know, he became his big superstar, and that's exactly what happened. You know the rest of uh, his story. You know, that's how he died. I was one of them, and the other, other people that came through my school, they made it, but some of them got fired, you know, Mitch McMahon, I worked for him for a year and a half. I'm the guy that brought him to Winnipeg for the first time in the Winnipeg Arena, and uh, Mr. McMahon was to still be friends, but I can't take it. I cannot take your punishment. <laughs> we took the friends up to date. And of course, uh, later on, I started uh, going up north, middle of nowhere, I never knew where I was going, but... A better gentleman in Winnipeg is just going to give you some new spot for you to go. Where is that? And he gave me a bunch of uh, Indian reservations up north, uh, all roads or whatever. But he said, you got to promise me one thing. I said, what is it? Uh, you got to talk to the kids. Stay away from drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. And I kept my word up to date. So, well, first time from to travel 125 miles, he took. 19 hours. The roads were terrible. Today, the same road, which I still promote once a year in February, about 15 different locations. From 19 hours, it takes me about seven hours. That's your difference on the roads. And that's exactly what happened. I keep going there every year as long as they book me and I uh, kept my word uh, up to date. And the guy that told me just to do this, that was named Phil Fontaine because he became a Grudge for Canada those days. I've been talking to him for months now, but he's the guy that told me what to do, what not to do up north. There you have it. 
And of course, those trips uh, from up north. That's when uh, I had Ed, Christian, Chris Jericho, uh, the Baron Von Rasky, the Mad Dog, and so forth. And I promoted practically every single one of them except Hulk Hogan. Uh, I worked with the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance, the Road Warriors, and Ric Flair, and all those guys that I brought to the city of Winnipeg. Uh, pick any name and I had them, right? So right now, I used to do uh, over 300 different matches a year, sometimes 250, 300. Now I only stick about max 20. That was it. Getting too bloody old now, right? I'm close to 80 years old, and people say to me, no, no, how can you do it? Well, you got to keep doing something, otherwise you die fast, right? That's yeah. my story, really. That is amazing, Tony. Thank you so much for sharing that. That brings up, I mean, there's just so many questions within there. Um, obviously, you know, I've, I've talked to I've talked to Massive Damage um, about his time on your tours as well, and the and the speaking that he does. Um, he he mentioned there was a time this year that a car went through um, the ice again. Is that does that happen very often for you guys on those lakes? What was that again? I'm sorry. The uh, Massive Damage said that one of the cars went through the ice this year. Does that happen very often? You know, you get some rude horn and you say, Tony, let me drive, and I let him, which I shouldn't have. You know, I cannot drive, you know, every goddamn hour, you know what I'm saying? But uh, sure anyway, he went through the bloody ice, man, and it took us six, six or seven hours to get out of there. I assume he came along and with a truck, whatever it was, and uh, was late for an event. But, uh, you know, the chief and council, they understand exactly what happened, so we're running a little bit late. But uh, that happens. It's very, very dangerous. If you've never been up there before, those roads, I'll tell you, they never come out of it. And you got to know exactly what, you, what you're doing. And now what's been happening that uh, on one road, and all of a sudden there's another a junction, right? But if you don't know where you're going, you'll never come out of it. Yeah, no, definitely. I've been on those northern Manitoba roads, not very north, but even southern Manitoba roads, and those can be definitely uh, disorienting for sure. Yeah, you got to know, you gotta know exactly where you're going. Otherwise, you'll be there for hours. Yeah, so... Again, now just to speak to your to your mentoring, to your training, and you're working with these this new generation of wrestlers. I'm I'm talking to Kid Cyrus about his two tours that he's done with you there. Um, what's that like for you to bring up generations of these wrestlers who are still doing this today? Well, what I say is this: if a new face comes up to us and he can finish the tour, he can wrestle anywhere in, in the world if he's good enough. Kid Cyrus is a very good wrestler, and I hope he gets a big break these days, which is very hard, because, uh, you know, there's only, you might as well say, Vince McMahon left, and now the AEW, which is Chris Jericho is there, and uh, he's hired a couple of good friends, which they worked for me before. But that's the breaks uh, that, that you, you might get. But it's, like I said, uh, yesterday was one thing, and today is very, very hard to get in with uh, Vince McMahon or impact wrestling, or whatever the case might be. But he's a very talented type of wrestler. He's a good listener, a young kid, you know, and a very good athlete on that ring. And there's a few guys like him that have the opportunity of making it. I'm talking about becoming a millionaire. You know, anybody can make it. It doesn't matter how you do it and what you're going to make. The catch, when I say to make it, I'm talking about you hit the millions, right? So this very good jerk with about 20 now, and Edge is a uh, movie actor, whatever. But uh, everyone, like I said, maybe 10 guys out of my bunch that uh, had the opportunity to get hired by Vince McMahon through me, that is. Uh, take Rhino, Edge, Christian, Lance Storm, all those guys. Today they are millionaires, so no, no, no doubt about it. But they were good listeners, good workers, and that's it. You cannot hire, you can, you'll never make it if you talk back to the promoter in any way, in any sense, doesn't matter what you do. I know a few guys that are Vince McMahon that cut your hair and they didn't, they get fired. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the guy that he is. That's why he's a billionaire, right? Yeah. No, that's it. Exactly. I've got, I'm being trained right now by uh, Marty, Mad Dog Sugar, out of the Kelowna area in BC. And he tells me, the first thing he told me in, in our match was, just listen, be a good listener, and that's number one, you know? Yeah, they got no time for your bullshit. You know what I'm saying? And here's your script to go and do it and be quiet. I always say when a wrestler leaves me and he's got an opportunity to go big, there's five things they have to 
to remember. And don't forget them because they'll spit you out like a, like a, like a chew gum. You got to say, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What time you want me to be in the arena, do your thing in the ring, and mind your own bloody business. And if Vince McMahon give an example, likes you, he'll make you. If you don't, where you go? Contract, no contract, he'll let you go. And that's the way it is. Yeah. Too much, too much, too much money involved to, to listen to your opinion or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, you have to put that stuff aside, right? Put your ego aside, definitely. So now, how do you see the state of indie wrestling in Canada then, today? That, oh, the independent scene. Well, you know why? There is a lot of promoter out there. I'm going to tell you one thing, and that's my opinion, and, uh, which I've seen it. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. They should never be promoters to start with, okay? Because they don't know very much about wrestling, and uh, they're bad... Uh, they give bad shows. They put, they put anybody in that ring. And I'm talking about anybody. That's even though a headlock and make him a wrestler. You understand what I'm talking about? If you're not good enough to go in that ring, professionally that is, and when I say professionally, you got to know what the hell you're doing. And I've seen a lot of scenes where guys do not belong in that ring. They wreck the business. And, of course, it's the price of that ticket that people come and watch you. I remember one fan... Here's an example from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He says, Tony is wrestling tomorrow night at the Maples here in Winnipeg. He says, yeah, okay. That's nice that you're going. He says, nope. I says, why? Because it's not your promotion. I said, how do you know that? It could be, right? Well, because they're only charging $5 to get in. They're a bunch of kids. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Got to keep those prices up. People buy tickets because of the price. If the, if, the, if, the, if the price of the ticket is 20 or 30 or 4 or 50 dollars or higher, if they buy the ticket and they come and they watch the episode, if they like it, you know what I mean? They'll be back. But if they don't like it, they do not come back. Simple as that. But if you put a price of $5, then you think you're going to draw a big crowd, they don't go for that. They think it's garbage, which it is. Yeah, you need to have a value for the ticket, right? That's right. I know a promoter that uh, does 30, 40 matches a year across the country. I'm not saying that I never did 30 matches across the country, across Canada. I did my days uh, back in the 70s or 80s, whatever I did. But I know what it takes to promote 30, 40 matches. Costs a lot of money. Yeah. But this guy, the way he does it, his, his expense per event is no more than $600. That's why he does it. Oh, how come it's six hundred dollars? Well, he's got eight or nine guys on the card that they didn't even get a nickel, and he promises them that they're going to be big superstars. That's how he gets away with it. Meanwhile, he draws not too bad, you know, two hundred people, three hundred gets like sometimes, sometimes fifty, but he's killing the whole territory in my books. He does this about four times a year, but I know now. I know now. I heard from the grapevine. He's in trouble with the government because he doesn't he didn't collect the GST or whatever. I mean, that's his problem, right? And they're after his ass. Uh, the end of the story is I make money now because of uh, the people that he hires and the people that do go for him. They, be, they believe him. They're going to be superstars. They work for nothing. So they, they only pay their own gas to get to the event. So there you have it. But just by saying, I'm a wrestler because I'm in a ring. You know what I mean? It's bullshit, right? Besides the point, that's their business, not mine. Right. Like, uh, I'll give an example. I had massive damage. One of the best guys I ever hired. I know him for many years. And uh, this guy here is tremendous. He's my booker. Every time I need anybody or anybody, any name, I fall mass and let him do a little better work. I mean, of course, I pay him really well. Beside the point, he's a very good guy. He's a hell of a talker uh, for promos and stuff. He's very, very, very professional. And the guys that he hires... Uh, we, we, we make a price, we say this guy wants uh, whatever, right? So, okay, hire him, and they send me pictures, videos, and so forth, and he's very good at doing that. Well, that's one of the guys, massive damage from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Okay, anything else what can I can say? No, honestly, man, thank you very much for the time, Tony. Thank you for, for, for sharing your stories with us today, and uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with, with a new generation of wrestlers. Really appreciate it. I hope one of these guys are going to come up there. One of these days. 
Yes, definitely. We're going to definitely be crossing paths once we can travel again in Canada. I'll definitely be calling you up. Thanks for the time. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was legendary promoter Tony Candelo joining us here on the Destro Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please don't forget to check us out on our social media feeds, Facebook, The Destro Show, Instagram, Destro the Eskimofo. We're on Twitter. The website is deslarine.com. Check us out on anchor.fm. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts. We are there, The Destro Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And once again, you guys have a great week. I'm Des Lorene. I'm going to be me, so you be you too.